Good morning, and welcome to Worship with Christ Presbyterian Church. Wherever you are, whenever you are watching, we are so glad that you have joined us this morning. My name is Cheryl Hayner, and I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Press. If you've been worshiping with us before, or if you are watching for the first time, we invite you to look for the link below the video where you can sign in and let us know that you are here. Your presence is valuable to us, and we want to be in touch with you and know how we can pray for you. These days, we are preparing for big changes as worship in the sanctuary begins on Sunday, August 1st. There will be two services. The contemporary service will meet at 9 a.m., and the classical service will meet at 10.30 a.m., with a half hour in between for conversation. To protect and care for our children, we will be wearing masks and we'll have some available if you come and forget yours. And we will be live streaming both services so that you can find us on YouTube, both at, for the 9 and the 10.30 services on Sunday morning and then during the week. Please go to our website, cpcmadison.org, for any further information about our worship or about other events uh, that are happening at Christ Press. This morning, we will listen to two of Jesus' stories about seeds and soils. When the disciples asked Jesus why he was telling stories, he said he wanted to create readiness in those who listened, wanted to nudge them to wake up to something new. So as we come to worship this morning, what new thing might God want to say to us? Will you join me in prayer? O oh God, we gather together in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you, eager to hear your word. Open our eyes and ears to the presence of your Holy Spirit. May the seeds of your word scattered among us this morning fall on fertile soil. May they take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good words and deeds. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher and our Lord. Amen. Each week we have the opportunity to participate in the gift of confession, bringing our lives into the light of God's presence and experiencing the freedom and goodness of God's expansive mercy. 
Friends, let us respond to God's invitation to come together in confession. First in a time of silence, then in corporate prayer. Let us pray in silence. And now together, Lord God, we come to you today offering our confession in honesty and humility. You are a God who speaks to us in many ways, yet too often we let the noise and clutter of life drown out your voice. Or we rest in what we have heard from you in the past and we tend to confuse just hearing your words with truly listening to you. Forgive us, we ask. Help us to believe that you are speaking to us now. Grow in us a desire to listen and to respond in faithfulness. We ask so that we might know you better and reflect you more fully. Let us join together in our assurance of forgiveness. Today, as always, God speaks declarations of mercy and grace. The scriptures tell us if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us truly listen to and receive God's word of forgiveness. Friends, believe this good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now as people who have received God's abundant peace, let us generously extend that peace to one another in person with those around you or through the chat on the service or perhaps you might want to text with friends or family or people that you would like to extend peace to as well. The peace of Christ be with you. Boys and girls, it's time for a moment for children. So gather around the screen that you're watching on, or if there's someone in your family who needs to be here with you, invite them to come. This morning, we're gonna talk about a very special event just for children, just for you. It's Vacation Bible School. Every summer, we gather together and spend some time learning about God learning about what God wants to say to us, how God wants us to grow. Katie Benzi and Kate Mayevsky have prepared a special video to announce this to you, so listen. Well, hello, Kate. Well, hello, Katie. Why are you so dressed up? Well. 
Why aren't you? I brought this for you. Uh, thank you. Uh, do I wear it this one? Uh, yes, that's okay. perfect. Okay. Now you look like a knight because it is important to announce that Westminster and Christ Presbyterian are teaming up again to do Vacation Bible School August 2nd through the 4th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Right here at CPC. Yes, and we're going to do it here in small groups outside just to be extra safe. But Katie, I'm not quite sure yet how the costumes and the coconuts figure into VBS. First of all, it's a horse. Oh, sorry, Katie. <laughs> sorry, right, common mistake. No, I'm actually in costume, and now so are you, because we are announcing the theme of VBS, which is the knights that say knee. I don't think so. Oh, North Castle. It's the Knights the Saint, Knights of North Castle. Yes, 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 that's right. It's such an awesome theme. We're going to talk about God, Jesus, truth, justice, and faith. And in addition to that awesome theme, now we just need two simple things. I know, a shrubbery. Um, no. First, we need kids. Kids, of course. So we invite all kids ages four through fifth grade to come with us on a VBS adventure. Yes, and then we need one more thing. Oh, I know we need- And not a shrubbery. Oh. Um, I guess we'd need some, some help. Yes, we need some volunteers. Well, that should be easy. Look at these fine, wonderful, and attractive folks right here. How can they resist our adorable little children? I mean, it's just, two tiny little hours for three little little days and i bet you we provide them with everything they need absolutely and even if they can't do three days guess what well if they can't do three days then we put them in the stockade and we do this until they submit knee 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 no let's go no okay even if they can't do three days we'll take anything they can offer one day maybe even two hours many hands make light work you are very wise, Kate Mayevsky. You know what? You've inspired me. I feel a royal proclamation coming on. A uh, what? Here you go. By order of the Children's Ministries at Christ and Westminster Presbyterian Churches, I hereby decree that VBS is open for sign up for both children and volunteers. Please consult your email or favorite Children's Ministry member for more information. A good time will be had by all as we will enjoy music, story time, sports, and crafts, along with a special visit from Sir Kona Ice on the last day. <laughs> Sir Kona Ice, I thought of that myself. Well done. Shall we away? Yes. Here's your horse. Each month, we highlight one of our Learn and Serve mission partners. And this week, we have the opportunity to hear about an amazing ministry, Madison International Partners, from our very own Jean-René Wachau. So, Jean-René? Uh, good morning, church. Uh, the past 16 months have been quite challenging for Madison International Partners, MIP as we know it, as the pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of many internationals we serve and compel us to adjust our operations in order to respond to their specific needs. In that regard, we are able to achieve some tangible results. For example, we provided a safe space where vulnerable internationals found God's love, community support, receive advice as they face isolation, discrimination, far from home and families. MIP stood by their side and rejected any form of racism or discrimination directed towards them. We distributed 275 grocery gift cards to internationals facing food insecurity, thanks to CPC Christmas Tree, which provided many of those. We launched a kids program that allow international children to
to read and connect with adult American volunteers through story time, science experiments, games, and art projects. We also started a very successful career development initiative that helps internationals with all aspects of job search and career counseling. Our citizenship class helped nine people obtain their U.S. citizenship this past year, including our own CPC member, Omar Okriso, who became a U.S. citizen last May. Further, our traditional program, such as English Conversation Time and Global Spouse Circle, have continued mostly online, allowing us to reach out across the globe. People from all parts of the world are able to connect through those programs that are held online. Most internationals who benefit from our programs are very grateful, as you could hear from our friend Muna. Hello everyone, I'm Muna Batrai. I'm a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I have been participating in this uh, English speaking program for almost six months and it has been incredibly helpful to me in terms of improving my competency and confidence in speaking English. I also get the opportunity to interact with uh, friends from different countries and different cultures and also get to learn American culture. Uh, all the volunteers in this program are just awesome. They are so friendly and they're always willing to help you. Um, if I had found this group three years ago when I first came to the U.S., my life would have been completely different. However, I'm still grateful that I found them um, even though it's six months ago. Uh, so uh, I feel like this group is a family for me where I can freely articulate my thoughts and my opinions. So thank you so much, John Renee, and thank you all the volunteers, all the team for having me in your group. I'm so grateful to be part of this SAT program. Thank you. All we do would not be possible without the invaluable support of CPC and our wonderful volunteers, to whom being part of this ministry means so much, as stated by Amy Stedner. Hi, my name is Amy Stetner, and I've been a volunteer with Global Spouse Circle for about a year and a half um, through the whole COVID pandemic. And during this time, I've been blessed with my relationships with other Global Spouse Circle volunteers and with participants from all over the world, places like Chile, Mexico, Cuba, Taiwan, Bhutan, really all corners of the globe. Um, and it's been a year like no other, yet we've supported and cared for each other through our weekly virtual meetings, sharing the challenges of new experiences like online schooling, pandemic, grocery shopping, and separation from family and friends. Despite this physical separation, our group has thrived and grown, um, and it's been a real joy to reunite in person this summer. And I look forward to welcoming new participants into a, our Global Spouse Circle family this fall as new international students, university workers, and their families arrive in Madison. It's clear that volunteers are the backbone of MIP and will once again be instrumental this fall when we return to in-person programming and activities. We'll need volunteers to provide welcome and hospitality to internationals as they come to Madison and transition to life here. We'll need volunteers for programs such as airport pickup, temporary housing, tour of Madison, apple picking, English conversation time, international friendship program. We hope we can count on you to volunteer with us. So we encourage you to check out all these volunteer opportunities on the MIP website, International Madison dot org slash volunteer or the CPC website cpcmadison.org slash internationals. Once again, we'd like to express our deepest gratitude for your continued prayers and support. 
Will you join me as we pray both for Vacation Bible School and Madison International Partners? God, we thank you for the ways that you are working in people's lives. Thank you for our children of our church and for what you will do this summer as they meet for Vacation Bible School. And we thank you for Jean René and for all the many, many volunteers and students and families who attend Madison International Partners. God, would you be at work this year? Be at work as, as we seek to welcome and love those who have come to our city to study. Thank you for this gift. And now receive the gifts that we offer, offering, offering of ourselves and of our, the things that we have, our money, our time, that the ministry that you have called us to might continue. In Jesus' name, amen. You may bring your gifts and offerings to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, as we come now to listen to your word, would you open our ears that we might truly listen to what you want to say to us? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us, for we are ready. In Jesus' name, amen. I imagine that we've all come to worship looking for something perhaps wisdom or encouragement for the next week, or maybe some hope for places where we are struggling, or a word of calm where life is chaotic for us, or a word of challenge if we're up for it. We are like baby birds in a nest with our mouths wide open, ready for the mother bird to bring the food that she has gathered for us. I imagine that many of you are hoping that the preacher has prepared a tasty meal for you that appeals to many and isn't too spicy or exotic. Comfort food. The crowds at the Sea of Galilee probably hoped the same. 
They were looking for good news in the oppressive culture in which they lived. And they were looking for someone who would save them. Would that be Jesus? Wherever Jesus went, he clearly announced the kingdom of God. The kingdom or the reign of God had come to earth, evidenced by all the physical and mental illnesses that Jesus healed, or when Jesus stilled the raging winds and waves on the Sea of Galilee. In Matthew 12, the chapter before today's scripture, things were heating up in Jesus' ministry. The Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders, were conspiring how to destroy Jesus because he healed a crippled man, the crippled hand of a man on the, in the Sabbath. This was breaking the rules that the Pharisees lived to protect. And then Matthew recounts a thought-provoking and somewhat unsettling conversation between Jesus' mother and brothers and Jesus. They had come to speak to Jesus, perhaps to ask him to tone down his rhetoric or to ask him to come home for a much needed vacation. In their presence, Jesus asked, who are my mother and brothers? Answering his own question, Jesus said, those who do the will of my Father in heaven are my mother and brother and sister. Wow, that was unexpected. Now in Matthew 13, Jesus has just left that conversation and is sitting on the beach at the lake shore. And as the crowds around him swelled, Jesus got in a boat out on the lake so that the crowds could see and hear him. And you know what Jesus did? He changed his strategy. He started telling stories somewhat like story time at the library, or to putting the kids or grandkids to bed with a story. I want you to imagine that we are all a part of the crowd listening to Jesus, straining to hear what he is saying from the boat. At one point, Jesus says to the crowd, are you listening to this? Really listening? So I say to you, as we listen to John Mark, Read the scripture for us from Matthew 13. Are you listening to this? Really listening? At about that same time, Jesus left the house and sat on the beach. In no time at all, a crowd gathered along the shoreline, forcing him to get into a boat. Using the boat as a pulpit, he addressed his congregation, telling stories. What do you make of this? A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road, and birds ate it. Some fell on the gravel. It sprouted quickly, but didn't put down roots, so when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. Some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really? listening? He told another story. God's kingdom is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. That night, when hired men were asleep, his enemy sowed thistles all through the wheat and slipped away before dawn. When the first green shoots appeared and the grain began to form, the thistles showed up too. The farmhands came to the farmer and said, Master, that was clean seed you planted, wasn't it? Where did these thistles come from? He answered, some enemy did this. The farmhands asked, should we weed out the thistles? He said, no, if you weed out the thistles, you will pull up the wheat too. Let them grow together until harvest time. Then I'll instruct the harvesters to pull up the thistles and tie them in bundles for the fire and then gather the wheat and put it in the barn. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love stories. They often remind us of truths that we have forgotten or prompt us to think about the ironies of life. Stories often have a twist, something that we didn't expect. Stories like this make us think, 
often disturb us or challenge us, make us uncomfortable. Sometimes stories nudge us to make a change. Jesus' stories definitely demanded that people think about what he said and respond. Stories were familiar to a Jewish audience. The rabbis told told stories to reinforce biblical truths. But Jesus' stories were different. Using everyday items like coins, sheep, seeds, farmers, soil, vineyards, birds, and weddings, Jesus invited his listeners to give up their assumptions, their opinions, their comfort, in order to embrace something new, often something new about who God was or is and about the work that God does. The disciples were surprised by the change in this way that Jesus taught. So following the first parable about the soils, Matthew says that the disciples asked Jesus, why are you telling stories? Jesus replied in verse 11 in the message, You've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. Not everybody has this gift, this insight. It hasn't been given to them. Whenever someone someone has a ready heart for this, Jesus said, the insights and understandings flow freely. But if there is no readiness, any trace of receptivity soon disappears. And Jesus continued, that's why I tell stories, to create readiness, to nudge the people toward a welcome awakening. Did you hear that? I tell stories, Jesus said, to create readiness, to nudge people to wake up to something new. Jesus wanted to provoke in those who heard him a hunger for something different than the status quo a hunger for what God was doing in the world and wanted to do in them. Jesus wanted to make them to wanted them to wake up to the new things he was doing. Jesus wants to provoke hunger in us as well, but a deep hunger that moves us beyond the ways we try to feed ourselves on busyness or trying to fulfill expectations or striving for more. A hunger that's not satisfied by our electronic gadgets or the foods we consume or the products we buy, the new adventures we pursue. These may make us feel full, but they never satisfy. They only lead to our being malnourished. In many parts of the world, both physical and spiritual malnourishment is easy to recognize easier to recognize than it is here. The first task of an aid worker is with a malnourished child is not to give them food, but to provoke hunger. Children and adults who are nearly dead of malnourishment have little hunger. So the health worker puts a little vitamin-enriched sugar water on a finger and sticks it in the mouth of the child. The first sign of hope is when the child cries again. Jesus' stories are like vitamin-enriched sugar water, nudging us, his listeners, to wake up, saying, I want some of that. Are you listening? Truly listening? Are you hungry? Ready to be nudged and awakened? I've heard dozens of sermons on the story of the four soils, and the message is usually something like this. Be the good soil where the seed can grow and the harvest is great. Don't be the hardened soil where the the seed is snatched away by the evil one before it can take root. Don't be rocky soil with no depth or foundation where the scorching sun or the troubles of this world wither the seedling seedlings who have no real root. Don't be full, a soil full of weeds where the worries of this world and the lure of wealth choke out any growth. The bottom line is, be the good soil. End of sermon. But as I've lived with this scripture for several weeks now, I have lots of questions. I'm not sure it's this simple. 
Ken Bailey, a Middle East scholar and teacher who taught for 40 years in Egypt, Lebanon, and Israel, describes a parable in this way. He says, a parable is an extended metaphor and as such is not a delivery system for an idea, but a house in which the reader or listener is invited to take up residence. So I've taken up residence in these two parables. I've sat in each room, opened closet doors, turned on lights, looked for hidden spaces, made myself at home in these stories. And I've always come away with questions, more questions than I probably have answers. But I invite you to join me in my search for understanding. I've wondered who the farmer is and why he, he or she is so careless with the seed. Is it God? Is it Jesus who widely declares that the kingdom is here? What we do know is that the farmer is a generous sower, wastefully scattering seeds in places where there is no promise of response. Those who listened on the lake shore knew all about planting and harvesting, much like many of you. They knew how to carefully conserve the precious seeds as they planted. And I imagine they were surprised when Jesus talked about this profligate farmer. But the question I ask is, do I believe that God, as the farmer, loves the world this much, loves me so much, that despite the condition of our soil, God keeps sowing the word of grace and love in us? in me. I've also wondered if we might be called to be farmers as well, generously sowing the seeds of God's love in the hardened, rocky, weedy places in our world. I've also wondered if we might, might be all the soils at one point or another in our lives. Of course, I long to be good soil where seeds can produce an abundance of fruit. And sometimes I am. But there are also times in my life when I've been the hardened path where I simply wasn't listening to God, nor did I want to. Sometimes I've been hardened by guilt, unable to forgive myself, unable to receive God's words of grace. Sometimes I've been hardened by anger, angry over the disappointments and circumstances in my life, not wanting to hear anything about God's way being best or God's intense love for me. I was content to sit in my hardness, but God still sows the seed. Sometimes I've been in rocky soil where I receive good news about God with great enthusiasm, exclaiming, I want some of that. It might be a sermon or a conversation that particularly spoke to me, or a song that provoked a hunger in me. But sadly, in a day or two, the troubles and difficulties of life seem to cause me to forget my hunger, to forget what I've heard. I'm so grateful for the way that Pastor Jessica's sermons stick with me. And as I've talked with many of you, they do for you as well. Definitely the sign of a good preacher, but also a sign of being ready to listen and to receive. Sometimes the weeds in my soil get the better of me. Jesus talks about the worries of life that choke out the good growth or the lure of wealth, always wanting more. I'm asking questions like, what am I worrying about that might be squelching the good things God wants to do in my life? I've wondered if I am lured by wealth. Am I afraid to relax my grip on my possessions or my bank account when someone is in need? I've also pondered what the farmer has to do to create good soil. How does the farmer create spiritual readiness? Writing about this story of the seeds and soils, author Richard Rohr says, most spiritual work is readying the student. Both soil and soul 
have to be a bit unsettled and loosened up a bit. As long as we're too comfortable, too opinionated, and too sure we have the whole truth, we're just rocks and thorns. And he continues, anybody throwing us seed is wasting time. Unsettled and loosened up. Have you noticed in your life that you are often most ready to listen to God when life is difficult, when circumstances are overwhelming, when you're struggling to keep your head above water? I've talked with many of you who in the worst times of your life felt that God, like God was present in significant ways because you were so dependent on God showing up. As the soil of your life was unloosened, and unsettled, you are a better listener. About 10 years ago, I lived in Atlanta and got a phone call from my mom in California saying that she was lying on the floor of her garage and was pretty sure she had broken her hip. My dad, whose dementia was worsening, had looked all over the house for a phone, having brought a variety of tools and remotes and finally brought the cell phone to my mom. My mom called friends who called 911 who came and took her to the hospital and then took care of my dad. I was on a plane to California in three hours. I've never prayed as much as I did during those three months. I was desperate. My sister and I needed supernatural wisdom at every step of the journey. We had to find a new place for my parents to live, a place that would accommodate my dad's dementia. We had to undo their house of 40 years and prepare it for sale. Getting my dad the right meds that would calm his, his intense anger and lessen his uncharacteristic meanness was one of my major prayers. There were also the small prayers like, please God, help the doctor to answer that phone. God, help. We're desperate, but we're choosing to trust you. The soil of my life was being loosened up, unsettled, and it was uncomfortable, at times terrifying and definitely troubling. But I was ready, ready to listen, ready to trust, and God was there. I wonder about us as a church. What kind of soil are we? We're moving into a season where we are being loosened up, perhaps a bit unsettled as we change worship schedules and as we move from worship online and outside to entering the sanctuary on August 1st, while also streaming live worship for both services. For many of us, this is good news. But for some of us, it is really uncomfortable. We like things the way they were. As we gather, we will bring with us the grief and loss of this last year, along with our anticipation. Will we let these changes cause us to be healthier soil, potentially more fruitful? Or will the rocks and weeds, the worries and distractions we all carry at some level get in the way? We can't do much to change our soil but we can trust the farmer who cares deeply about the soil and the seed. We can trust that the farmer who tends the soil knows when to let the weeds grow alongside the wheat until judgment time. We can trust the generous farmer who seems to waste seeds on those who aren't ready to hear. Trust that the farmer has greater desires for our growth and for abundance than we as soil could ever have. Are you listening? Really listening? How is the Spirit nudging you today? How will the Spirit nudge us? We can trust this God. Amen. Please join me in a responsive prayers of the people followed by the Lord's Prayer, which will be found in the bulletin. Please pray with me. 
For all the blessings of this life, we give thanks to you, Creator God, for families, friends, colleagues, neighbors, and strangers who nurture us, that the love of God may grow within, that your love, your word, like a seed, may grow to produce in us good fruit. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For the leaders of various nations and cities, that they may lead with strong hearts and gentle hands and generous spirits, with compassion and mercy, with wisdom and grace. May they reflect your will, guiding all their actions and decisions. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For those who serve in harm's way, those who live in dangerous places, those who live in areas of war and strife, those who live in fear, those who worry about employment, bills, food, and struggle just to find dignity in life, may your grace bring peace and safety to all people, one to another. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For those who suffer from any illness or disease of mind, body, or spirit, restore these and all those we carry in our hearts to fullness of, of health, health as only you, O oh God, can bring. May your mercy shower each of us with healing, mercy, and love. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For those who are dying and those who have died, send forth your comforting love. Give solace to those who mourn. Console those who grieve. May your grace surround us like a mantle upon our heads, a shawl upon our shoulders, a hand to hold your hand. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. And now join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, as we leave this place, keep listening. Watch for nudges, the nudges of the Holy Spirit, for God might want to do a new thing in you. And remember that no matter where, what soil you are, God's pursuing love is still planted in you every day. Remember this, for we believe in a God who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or even imagine, according to the power at work within us. To God be glory in, from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Go in peace.